We can't chew gum on watch, Sergeant, she said. Fawn nodded, then shoved the pack of gum in the girl's pocket. For later then, Fawn said, but she continued to hold her gaze. Yes, Sergeant? I know it sucks having people yell at you, tell you what to do all day, but once you're done here and you're out in the field, you'll wish there was some loud bitch holding your hand, hmm? Fawn said. Raising an eyebrow, she scanned all three girls. They all nodded slowly. Fawn knocked on the podium and lazily saluted the flag next to it, then plodded out into the wet haze that had taken over the day. The cold quickly embraced her mercilessly, as a man would shake the hand of another he disliked on first meeting. She sniffed, then hopped down the short set of steps and walked with a quick pace toward the bus stop. Walking down the hill the complex of barracks sat on, Fawn could see the boarded windows of shops that had closed down when the war started. Paint-stripped apartments and townhomes stood before the olive-colored hills surrounding the base, all crowned with a gray melting slush. This area had been filled with many families before, military families most likely. Looking at the war from afar, many would think that the constant fighting and resource grabbing was foolish. Look how it had decimated the population, especially that of the younger men multiple generations dead. So many that women would have to finish the battle that their men had started. Some thought it was a good thing, this war, thinning the men out. The war would end, they thought, when fewer and fewer boys would come home. But this only made the fire burn brighter and hotter, for the resources and land gained were just a perk. Revenge seemed to be the goal, a goal that every woman fighting found a noble one. There was no need for buildings to house the prisoners, no guards to watch over them. Genocide was a word that had been forgotten, its entry in the dictionary, made indecipherable by tears. With her hands shoved deep in her pockets and her eyes to the sunless gray sky, Fawn wondered if this planet would ever be free from strife without both sides ending each other. The sickness of mutually assured destruction had gripped her when a faceless admiral had decided to snatch away her family perished when the research facility they were assigned to was deemed in play by the Fasa Samara. Everyone watched live as a civilian organization was turned into space debris with a single volley from the Fasa's flagship. It only made it harder when her brother Alpha went MIA a year after. She knew her brother must have been alive somewhere in her mind. Alpha did not have it in him to simply desert his duty. He was a volunteer after all, but many other men possibly better men had run, not wanting to be used up completely before they lost a limb, lost their mind, or worse. The bus pulled up just as Fawn was about to sit down on the weathered bench. She climbed on, scanned her ID at the terminal, and sat in the back of the empty bus. She fumbled around with her handheld accessory to her antlers, thumbing through the horde of messages she had received, mostly from those in her squad and her friends she had met throughout her travels always hoping to see one from her brother. She came upon a five-month-old message from a man she had a fling with long before she had made sergeant, just after her officer's commission had been withdrawn. Each time she looked it over, she thought the worst. Messages nearly every other day, then finally, nothing. She sighed and shoved the device back into her pocket, threw on her hood, and nuzzled against the wall of the bus. When the bus made one of its few stops, Fawn hopped off onto the wet sidewalk and strode up the near-empty street to a pub she frequented. Inside was warm, dark and smoky. Some uninspired jazz tune was leaking from the tattered speakers randomly sprinkled throughout the bar. Fawn snatched off her beret and shoved it into her back pocket so that it could be reunited with the deep creases and wrinkles it had found before. She unzipped her jacket and she rolled up to the bar. On her left, an old beat-up pool table. On her right were mostly empty booths, stiff and stained cushions prolapsed from old tears in the ragged brown leather. Crusty yellow propaganda posters with curled corners seemed to be peeling themselves away from the dingy, soot-covered walls, each one framed by a ratty Von Brocklin flag. There were three drunks in the corner laughing a little too hard at a mildly amusing quip. Fawn ignored them and plopped down at the bar, which had been shellacked with varnish far too many times several years ago. An old grizzled bartender nodded and hobbled from the stool he was sitting on at the back, between barrels that could have only found use as decoration. 
With his sleeveless shirt and cut-off shorts, he seemed to be proudly displaying his war wounds, artificial knees and cybernetic shoulder, all paid for most likely, but grossly out of date. He was only up briefly to throw Fawn a beer and then return to his stool. There were bottle openers embedded underneath the bottom of the bar. In two swift motions, it was open. She let the cap fall into the reservoir beneath her feet. Fawn exhaled and then sipped on the cool brown bottle, trying to pay attention to some silly game show that she could never figure out the rules to. The three in the corner laughed louder, pulling her focus away yet again. She looked over to them and then pulled out her antlers handset, turning the volume down on her earpieces, and then thumbing through the news that was carefully filtered and tardily sent out to them. On the display, a message popped up from Lechway. Her avatar was a basket of puppies, and for some reason it hurt Fawn's heart a little to look at it. But where would I keep one, she thought. It was tough just holding on to general issue. She opened the message, and it was a picture of the food her and Chittle had asked for. The woman had faith in Fawn when it came to any threat not concerning hunger. Suddenly, Fawn smelled stale breath and cigarettes. She turned to her right to find a weaving, stubbly-faced man leaning on the bar just beside her. He was an oval-faced, weak-chinned slob who looked as though he was in a constant battle with his own stupidity. Normally, his looks would be about average, but the male-to-female ratio was grossly out of order and Fawn guessed the man would be particularly gassed up in his position. She bothered herself to turn the sound up on her earpieces, though she knew already what would drop out of his mouth. He smiled crookedly. His red eyes were barely open, and his shirt looked as though he had not bothered to snap a few wrinkles loose before throwing it on. Fawn looked over to his friends waiting in the booth. They beckoned to her, cigarettes between their fingers, wafting their arms slowly as if they were directing traffic. She looked back to the man, who had invaded her bubble of uninfluenced sovereignty without a word. We got a room, he said, jerking his thumb over his shoulder casually. I'm good right here, Fawn said, turning back to her beer, pressing the cold bottle against her lips as the man paused to think of something to say. She could almost hear the man's mind work. Come on, he said, swaying on his heels and then the sides of his boots. All right. What am I going to do over there that I can't do over here, she said, staring him down as she watched his mind work. I don't know. Have fun, he said, body shifting, throwing back awkward glances to his friends. What if I don't like fun, she said, turning to him and crossing her arms. Well, you're a woman, he said. Fun nodded. Okay. And I'm a man. You might be, she said. Hey, what's your problem, lady? You don't like guys? He said. Huh? I love them. Love to hug them and fuck them, she said loudly. The man leaned in closer. Well, all right, he said. Fawn stopped him with a stiff arm. Don't fuck cowards, though, she said. The stupid grin on the man's face went missing as he glared at her in disbelief. He started to say something and then turned away slowly, beginning the long, embarrassing walk back to the booth his friends were partying in. Fawn watched him halfway to make sure he was actually leaving, and then turned back to the show she had no interest in. She shook her head when she thought of the state of her people. The men that were left, the common ones anyway, were mostly like the man that had approached her, or the old barkeep. They had sent their best to die, and now what was left seemed not worth defending from the claws of the Fossas. She had heard of programs being started to save the men getting them out of conscription to work in jobs to support the war effort as women had done for their men in the great wars on earth so long ago. The government required all men to have a sample of their sperm frozen, though everyone had to have known they threw most of it away. It was too great of an opportunity, a eugenics program without the messiness of sterilizing the undesirables. Perhaps the Ubermensch was in sight. Fawn knew that the man's friends were glaring at her, hating her because she would have nothing to do with their pathetic little party. She anticipated some trouble and ordered a few shots in case she needed her fists especially tight and numb. But soon the little group was once again stricken with the fits of backslapping and obnoxious laughter. Though the atmosphere had lost most of its tension, it had only seeped into Fawn's muscles, tightened her hold on her beer. Several beers and a couple of shots later, Fawn was on the street again finished with her errands and heading up the street to buy her friends some late dinner. The wet and chilly air forced her to zip her jacket up to the collar. 
She could see the lights of the little food truck and hoped there would not be a long line when she got there. Just now feeling the effects of hunger. She lamented going back out into the field. But she would never miss this shit pin town, which only existed because there were still a few soldiers around. But that money would soon be drying out. With nearly all of the men gone, the sex workers and ball broads had moved away decades ago. And like them, the watering holes would be done as soon as this place stopped being a holdover for troops in transition to deployed status. Fawn gave a sigh of relief when she reached Rena's. She ordered some drinks and four bowls. She watched the mastery of the little old ladies prepare the food inside and breathed in the smell of meats, onions, and peppers.